My yeah. favorite childhood advert was uh, for like a super soaker. Oh, they and it was like the desert, okay? Uh, oh, and desert. It was, it, was, it, was, it was this old man and he was <laughs> like growing through the desert. And he was going, more water, <laughs> more water. Oh, and then strange. a guy comes out with a super soaker and goes, more water. <laughs> Just like soaked so all these kids come out and have this massive water fight, and this old man is just like soaked with water. Yeah. You and I, we've been doing this for 112 12 episodes now. We've never done the my name is James Briefle, and today I'm joined by. We like do our first and last names, mm. and we don't. We just sort of go with it. We we do intro, light intro the show. I think just tell people what they're doing. Yeah, we we like to do a little bit of an intro, but I think we don't want to be too formal because otherwise, if you went to see your pub, went to see your pub, went to your friends at the pub, yeah, you'd be yeah. like, "Hi, I'm James Briefel, and this is my consigliere, George yes, Pundek." Yeah, it would be, be a bit standoffish because a lot of like the things you have to do to like host a podcast in inverted commas are slightly unnatural. You have to like every so often just go. And then what we're doing today, guys, is and sort of like start presenting. Yes. But um, I try to avoid that as much as possible because it takes a while to learn how to do that. Yeah. And you, it becomes really awkward. Like, remember the first time we tried to record a welcome message for the show? My and brain our brain's melted. like completely melted because it's like a muscle you've never exercised before. Mm. But yes. um, yeah, well, like, guys, we just recorded our... Oh, sorry, you were going to say something. No, I was, I was just going to say, I, li I like to think we've kind of organically folded the kind of presentary stuff into the yeah. structure of the show over time yeah. but but evidently not because we're still <laughs> just talking <laughs> over each, each other. other i actually have become quite conscious amongst like my friends and my like friends friends periphery people who aren't my close friends that i don't want to be that that podcast guy because mm. i've had some people say when they've asked me something about film i've spoken in very full sentences and they're like all right podcaster and i'm uh, like oh i really wasn't trying to but sometimes i think and then sometimes they'll be like james does a podcast what did you think of poor things and i'll ooh. just go yeah it's great because i don't want to go into a whole thing but sometimes people are like uh-huh yeah i thought he did a podcast i know you, you're like i can offer you one sentence or five minutes yeah nothing in between I, it's, it's true people are like, oh yeah george um and I get, do you know what? You'd be having lunch with people and you hear people start talking about film and it's yeah. like, you can see it's going to come around to you yeah. any minute now. And you're like, I'm just having my lunch. I saw Past Lives like six months ago. Don't ask me about yeah. it. <laughs> George, what did you think of Past Lives? Yeah. And you're like, I could talk for half an hour about that film. Yeah. Yeah. Or I could talk for one sentence. So I kind of go, oh yeah, it's good. Yeah, yeah. If you, do you like that kind of thing? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you don't cool. want to be the guy that drops his knife and fork, wipes his mouth and goes, yeah. you know, think about Lanthimos and based on yeah, his previous yeah. work, you know, really sort of drawing from all these, you, know, you don't want to be that guy. No, you don't want to no. be that guy. Uh, but we just recorded our reactions to the 2024 Oscar nominations, mm. which will be out very soon. So make sure you go and check that out. You actually join us on a very exciting week because not only have we got that little extra bit of content out about the, the Oscars, but we have a special guest at the end of this episode, yes. all the way from across the pond um you guys if you're a regular film follower or a po film podcaster listener you'll be aware of a film podcast out in the states called raiders of the lost podcast another film podcast mm -hmm. with a pun on a famous film title we just had to collab run by anthony and james two twins out there great guys um james was over in the uk filming something and he popped along and we headed to a studio and we had a great conversation we've recorded a whole conversation about movies that's really fun and really engaging he was that's great. coming out later in the week as a, as a bonus episode. And you'll also see some stuff with him on social media. So make sure you follow us on Instagram and TikTok. Um, but he also joins us at the end of this episode for some games, of course. He is in the hot seat for the games. Yes. So the, the scenery will change if you're watching this. Yes. And we will cut back a few days ago when I was in the midst of a very heavy cold. Mm -hmm and we play some games with him. And I just want to give a special thank you to the Ground Floor Podcast Studios for letting us use their space. We mm. wanted to invite him over. Sometimes it's a bit clunky to get three people in here. And my friends, James and Ollie, run a podcast studio over there. If you did want to, if you're in London and you want to rent a podcast studio, these guys have a really amazing space in a central London location. They are offering... Uh, Breakdown hourly rates with with an edit and social media mm. clips included for a really genuinely good price. I know like production, editing, filming is a huge barrier to entry for a lot of people to do podcasts. So I will leave a link, uh, wearegroundfloor.com or .co.uk. The link will be in the description to go and book it if you guys wanted to use that space. Uh, I definitely recommend it. It was great. And I will say, I really enjoyed on that freezing cold Saturday when I had a cold, yeah. going to Chancery Lane slash Temple, where, oh. the, where the, the studio is based. Yeah. 
what a lovely part of old London that I never walked through, going past the Royal Courts of yeah, Justice. Yeah, th- those bits are very nice. Court, it is a bit office and corporate in yes, some sense. Kind of, there is a jagged... Lovely old pubs called, like, The Diplomat or, like, yes. The Advocate. And, and, and old <laughs> pubs written with O-L-D-E. You Old-D, know? yeah. Old, yeah. yeah. Um, no, O-L-D-E. I wouldn't say that as old. I know, but, like, I'm saying... Oh, oldie. Yeah. I'm yeah, sorry, oldie. James. Ye oldie. I'm, yeah. Thank 100, you. 112 episodes. Yeah, I know. One day, we're going <laughs> to click... <laughs> One day we'll develop some chemistry. One day we'll have some chemistry. We'll actually get going. And we'll finish each other's. Anyway, we have some reviews as well this episode. James, we will be do- talking about what? Danny Kaluuya's first directorial Danny. film. Danny? Is he Danny? Daniel. I said Daniel. Oh, did you have Daniel. Daniel. Daniel Kaluuya. Daniel. Daniel. Uh, the Kitchen, Netflix film that came out, uh, I think, just this last Friday. Uh, also, The End We Start From, new film starring Jodie Comer, also produced by Mark Strong. Oh, good. And Benedict Cumberbatch. Yes. Um, and yeah, uh, we'll be talking about that today. James has had a chance to go and see these films. I haven't, so it's James reviewing them today, and I'll be Sorry. here nodding. <laughs> it was so funny in the bonus when you had the lasagna. I edited it back, and you were really honest, like, you got 20 minutes. The cheese and the meat is just sucking the blood from my brain. <laughs> There's this moment when I finish my review of... Um, oh, what Nights did I see? Him? Nights of Him. And you just go... And I finish, and you go... All right, <laughs> just get up and go to eat. Uh, keen-eyed listeners of the bonus will find that. But yeah, on with the show. Do you not think that um, it's a bit like, it's almost like a commercial loss that no one's made G.I. Jane 2 in the last two years? Jaden, I love you. Like surely if you were in Hollywood, you would just make that film. Why are you saying that? Because you just would. It's like, oh, you mean- imagine if G.I. Jane 2 came out, regardless if Jada Pinkett Smith was in it. And how much money would you give Chris Rock to like do a scene? <laughs> like it's just such an obvious win that happens I would immediately I, commission G.I.J. who owns the IP at, who's, le- at least an SNL skit should have been done about it yeah. at least something like on set on G.I.J. 2 I just think it's really untapped like enough time has elapsed that's a good that's where a, yeah. something should have happened there but here we are without a G.I. Jane 2. You've got the other 2022 jokes. <laughs> it's a real 2022 <laughs> joke, but it's more that now there's been enough time. Yes, I see what you mean. That, that something it. should have come, come from Jane that. G.I. Jane and sort of G.I. Joe, not, not big things over here. No, never never got it. I know it's a big action figure thing. Action Man was bigger here, I think. Action Man, yeah, until someone was like, you know, that's just Barbie dressed up differently. Yeah. I used to play with Action Man, and I was like, oh. I had the Action Man that you could, like, wind his legs and you put him in some water. And yes, like, I had the same one, and he, he, he swam with yeah. his arms. Yeah, yeah I had really Parachute cool. Action Man, Yes, and I'd too. throw him off buildings, but the parachute never really worked, and he'd no. get stuck in a tree, and then poking the tree. Child and, 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 yeah. But the the, uh, the ads on, like, Cartoon Network, oh, yeah. which is Action Man, the greatest hero of them all, like, on a jet ski, like, bursting through I, a thing. My, my favourite childhood advert a was... A kid with really was, spiky hair. I'd be like, this I, is awesome! Yeah, was, uh, <laughs> yeah. Totally rad. My yeah. favourite childhood advert was uh, for, like, a super soaker. Oh, they and it was, like, like, the desert, okay? Uh, oh, and desert. It was, it, was, it, was, it was this old man, and he was, <laughs> like, growing through the desert, and he was going, more water! <laughs> More water. And then a guy comes out with a super star and goes, more water. <laughs> just like soaks him. All these kids come out and have this massive water fight. And this old man is just like soaked with water. You wanted and water? Then, yeah. These now, lovely little now you got it. white children give it and to it you. it worked. It worked. Yeah. Because I remember it. Yeah. I used to always remember they were in a very pristinely cut lawn. Mm. And, the, and the colors of the super soakers really like popped. I remember like, who, who was having this like infinite budget water fight? At home with like yeah. everyone got there. You know, usually at water fights, one person had a super oh, soaker gosh, yeah. and everyone else had like tiny little things. And, it was... and they were, they, they hurt. They were quite powerful. Yeah. And they, if you, you pump them you get, up. You get the, the guy, the, the, the kid in the, your class who had developed the most yeah. pumping that thing like crazy. Yeah. You're like <laughs> the mountain <laughs> of your year. Yeah. yeah. Just, <laughs> and they like cut a hole in you. Yeah. And then you'd all be after a while just wet and get cold and get shivery. And yeah. Then, and then the parent would ring and be like, come on, time for food. A friend of mine once had a water water fight party and he, he like made loads of like water bombs. It was a really great How water fight. It was actually quite odd. I think we were 12, oh, yeah. 12, 13, like all, on the older side of a water fight party, but he did it like properly. And I remember they, they had like bases and teams and they would keep prisoners. If you got tagged, you'd oh, go to Lord. prison and then you come out. It was a bit of Stanford prison experiment. Yeah. But like one kid brought this fart spray in and it was like, oh, the prisoners are going to get sprayed with fart spray. And this guy really sprayed my oh. hair. And George, I swear <laughs> to God, for like seven months, every time I showered, I would just smell fart coming down my face. And I was like, I really don't know what to do. And I was like double, triple washing it. Yeah. And 
Yeah, every time I like think of water fights, I think of the smell of farts. <laughs> like, I've never, I don't think I've had a water fight since. I wonder if you've still got that smell in your hair. Yeah. <laughs> George is like, that's oh, what it was. <laughs> that makes it sense. Explains. Anyway. Anyway. I've, I've been on a bit of a dystopian double bill. Okay. Oh, a little like bit. That. Yeah, with uh, the kitchen and the end we start from. Mm. Both sort of near future. Mm. Strap in, folks. Yeah. This one cheer. is the end we start from which is directed by Mahalia Bello uh, from a book of the same name by Megan Hunter, which I've not read. And it's adapted by Alice Birch, who's got writing credits on Succession, Normal People and Lady Macbeth. Yes, I recognize the name. So some good credentials there. Um, film starts with a very heavily pregnant Jodie Comer. Great uh, Great, really sort of as hot as it gets in terms of hot prospect for, yeah, for actor. Uh, the hot talent at the moment in terms of... Yeah, Hollywood. Yeah, pounds. great in um, Killing Eve and uh, The Last Duel. Yeah. And, and Free Guy. Free Guy. Yeah, she yeah, she is good at that. Yeah, yeah, she went all blockbuster on us, didn't she? Yeah. The Ryan Reynolds one. Yeah, mm. yeah. Um, so the film starts with a very, in London, with a very heavily pregnant Jodie Poma. Nine months, about nine and a half months even, about to pop. Um, and while she's sort of living her very heavily pregnant life, this very heavy rain pounding on the sides of the windows. Um, and we are lightly introduced to this. It's, it's not even what I'd say in near future. I'd say, I'd say it's present day. It always felt very present day um, where there's extensive flooding happening all over the UK. We sort of hear the news in the background, floods, London flooding, low-lying areas flooding. Uh, and she starts to feel contractions and the water outside is getting stronger and heavier and her water breaks. At the same time, water breaks into her house and starts to flood and London is starting to flood and we've got this cute, this very stressful birthing scene rushed to an overrun hospital that is also flooding. And we get a birthing shot, George, that is right down the right down where the sun don't shine we get the whole thing uh, and the connection is obviously made with water breaking of the body and of that, the home you. like yeah. this connection to the world event and her uh, she and her partner who's played by Joel Fry who was uh, the last time yes. I saw him in was in Cruella yes I know yeah yeah Joel as Fry. Ja Jasper or Horace I can't remember which one and so they decide like many others in the UK to flee to high lying villages and towns in the UK but the problem is there are these everyone's trying to do this and there are these um, corded security checkpoints at all of the mm. the high villages and towns they they're literally in the queue and um, her partner's character's parents actually live in one of the, conveniently live in one of these high, high areas. But, you know, you're not, they're not residents of this village, so they're not being allowed through. And, you know, Jodie Comer says to the guy, like, please, I've got a two-day-old baby, can you let me through? And the guy sort of apprehensively lets them through because, you know, parents live there. So it remains safe for a period of time with living with their parents and Mark Strong, mm. who's also a producer on this. Um, but the flooding continues and because it continues, society around them starts to crumble. There's famine, there's food shortages oh. and everything outside of the comfort of their home becomes very unsafe. Um, the couple becomes separated and she's introduced to another mother who also has a young child, played by Catherine Waterston, who's actually a really great um, light presence in this. Oh. Uh, she's very really nice. Um, Benedict Cumberbatch also in this has a couple of scenes, very like uh, Kevin Bacon-esque in terms of uh, uh, how long he's in it in... Um, Leave the World Behind. Leave the World Behind. Yeah, yeah. He, has, he, has, he, has, he has a couple of scenes. Nice. Not the same kind of character, but yes. you know... He's in it. Hi, like, Benedict Cumberbatch. Yeah. And he's doing, for the first time, I think, Benedict Cumberbatch, a voice that's the closest to Benedict Cumberbatch's voice. Because huh. he's such an actor chameleon. And he's always from, like, Smaug to Julian Assange mm. to Sherlock. He's always doing something different. But I was like, you just sound like Benedict Cumberbatch. Yeah, good. It also works. Get away Benedict. from that Doctor Strange accent. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Go back to your, your home. He sounds great. Um, so, as I describe it to you, it sounds very much like Walking Dead, post-apocalypse, survival film, uh, worst of humanity once, once stress comes to that. But, you know, it's not dystopian. It's very relevant. It's very present. And it feels very much like it's an issue of today. Flooding, sort of... Mm. Uh, my first thought when I, when I watched it was, this is happening to people in London, but as we know, millions of people every year, I don't know how many, are displaced because of environmental flooding, yeah. natural disasters, war. People are forced to leave yeah. their homes, migrate, go to camps, separated from their families. This isn't a futuristic no. issue. This is something that happens to people very much today. Also, sorry, because that, in the UK, that is our probably main like ecological disaster point. We don't have tornadoes, we don't have yeah. earthquakes, we don't have hurricanes, but flooding is the main Typically, issue. Typically, flooding in the yeah. north and in low-lying areas is, yeah. is a problem. Um, so, yeah, I, th I thought of, you know, elements of Cormac McCarthy's The Road, nowhere near as dark as The Road, but sort of 
you know, this idea of like clinging on to what you have, the world sort of slightly falling around you. What I liked about the film, and I think some people might not like about it, is that this film was really low key. And I describe it as minimalist, actually, mm. which I really appreciated. I, I thought, especially in the last sort of 20, 30 minutes of the film, I really admired, admired how restrained it was, how much of a steady hand it had. Um, I thought it's paced very evenly. And I think it's, it's, it's very good at just gently letting a feeling evoke and letting it stick with you. Uh, the, the score's very good. I'm sorry, I can't remember the composer. And it's got very great performances. It's almost like as I'm watching it, everything that usually counts against a film is like tick, mm. tick, tick. And a lot of it's really counting it for, for itself. And I just found that really wonderful feeling when you finish a film. It's very atmospheric and very thought provoking. And on my walk home from the cinema, I was oozing with interesting ideas, but it never screamed them at me. Mm. And I really, really appreciated it for that. And I didn't really have many expectations going into it. I didn't really know what it was about going in. And it sort of crept up on me. And towards the end, I had quite a nice emotional reaction mm. to it. And I do think people should go and see it. You know, it's about how sort of nature and the body, how a baby can basically uplift your entire life and disrupt everything. And that you could almost be an allegory for post, post, uh, post depression. Data depression. Um, and what, what I also thought, and I don't know if this is, this film maker has made a comment on this, but I think when we look back on this film in this t- post 2020s era, we'll go, this film definitely exists from people who've written something and gone through a pandemic. It's not a pandemic film. It's not about a virus. It's not about COVID. But it's something I think really smart that it doesn't tell you. People having their lives uprooted and disrupted, but still wanting to find connection with people that they love. Mm. And it's got nothing to do with COVID. I, I will look back at that film and go, that is a film that was made after the COVID pandemic, even though it has nothing to do with it. Um, Jodie Coma is really good. I yeah. thought she was very solid throughout. And then there was one scene in particular I thought she was really great. And I sat back and went, that Jodie Coma, she really, mm. she really can act and she really does bring it home great great baby acting apparently they went through like 40 plus babies because all the babies were real and you got it you can only have a baby working for like a minute at a time slackers obviously which is fine yeah because yeah, baby um i did find uh jody coba is is liver Buglian, and, and she has a very good southern english yeah. accent or a slight northern all the way throughout but there were just like two scenes i say where she just goes just goes full scouse and really? it's just all the way. And she, you know those inflections where they go up? Yeah. It was just kind of there. And I was like, oh, and then it's over. <laughs> <laughs> but otherwise, she, she's really, really great. Um, don't sleep on it. I would say go and see it if you're, if you're wondering. I, I wouldn't let it pass you by. Mm. It's still, it still stuck with me, and I saw it yesterday. I very much enjoyed it. That was The End We Start From, starring Jodie Coma. If you've seen it, let us know your thoughts at hello at popkitchenpodcast.com. We'd love to know what you think. Next up in my dystopian double bill is The Kitchen. The first film we've reviewed that has a word that is in our title. Oh, yes. Pulp Kitchen reviews Pulp kitchen. The Kitchen. The Kitchen. I mean, I like to think that when people say The Kitchen, they know, they think of us. Yeah, Boys in the Kitchen. You guys listen to The Kitchen this week? Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah, yeah. Hey. Oh, The Kitchen. Those guys. Which kitchen? What the Pulp called? Kitchen. You what know, the hell you think I'm talking about? I don't about? remember The Kitchen, guys. Yeah. You know, the guy is talking like this. But we're talking about... Daniel Kaluuya. Also, sorry, can I say, do you yeah. know there was another film called The Kitchen about five years ago with Melissa McCarthy, Elizabeth oh. Moss, and I think, was it Taraji P. Henson? That sounds familiar. And Donald Gleeson, and it kind of just kind of floated around, but it's really? just there, yeah, like yeah. a prime thing. Anyway, interesting. Speaking of floating around, this film might float around. You mm. and I got to see this uh, a few months ago at a Netflix preview event. We saw a clip from the film, and Daniel Kaluuya came out, and yes. he's very much in the mix of editing. We he got to sort of talk a little bit about the film. It's his first directorial debut, and he's also directing, co-directing it with Kibwe Tavares. Set in a near-future dystopian London, which I said already in my yes. last review. <laughs> um, you know, it's a commentary on urban housing, gentrification, the presence of the state in oppressing culture and morphing a city. Um, I think it's quite common in our dystopias in sci-fi and anything that we write to exacerbate the gap between the rich and the poor. That's often something that will, you you look at sci-fi and we very rarely go, and everyone just aren't the same in 50 years. We sort of know as a humanity that our system is slightly broken and this gap will get further and further. Um, What I like is that although that idea is not new, I think the kitchen explores that in a very new and refreshing way. So we have a character called Izzy, who's played by Kane Robertson, who lives in the kitchen, which is a large, sprawling, urban house housing project that's sort of become its own hub and it's sort of been taken over. A lot of it's shot in the Barbican. 
So very much like brutalist, yeah. gray. Um, it's sort of sprawling with stacks on top of each other, kind of like a vertical urban favela. Yeah. Um, like little bits sticking out, wires coming across, lots of scorched, scorched neon, dusty gray, very beautifully shot, lots of pops of color, color in there. And the houses in this, in the kitchen are predominantly the city's poor community and they are frequently and aggressively raided by the police. And they call it the kitchen because when people from the high up levels see the police coming, they bang their pots and pans with spoons, mm. kind of like sort of a clap for carers thing, but <laughs> a bit more, a bit more sinister. Um, and Izzy works at this futuristic funeral service called Life After Life, which is very calm and pleasant, but actually it's a little bit like we don't have the space to bury anyone, right. so or cremate people. So what they do is, if you're too poor to afford a burial, you can instead, uh, I assume, cremate your loved one and have their. Um, ashes used to, to build a plant. Their matter. Their matter, yeah. yeah uh, to sort of, and you can sort of go and visit that plant and it's sort of very sort of soft and welcoming, but also like kind of horrible. Oh, um, nice. And uh, so Izzy's very much like a loner and he does a lot of pouting and glaring out of windows and looking at the mm. state of the world. And he encounters this recently orphaned teen named Benji, played by Jediah Bannerman, um, who starts to sort of cling on to Izzy as this sort of mental figure and sort of following him into the kitchen and subsequently getting, um, you know, getting introduced to this, sirens on our end, getting introduced to this group of young vigilante activists who are sort of fighting back against the police who are surveilling them, raiding them. There's these drones that sort of float outside the kitchen that monitor and scan the faces of the kids and they like try and like throw things at, at these drones. Um, so far, so sci-fi. So far, uh, oh, so sci-fi. Uh, and that sort of dynamic creates, so Izzy's actually planning on leaving the kitchen. He wants to sort of not have to be here anymore. He's looking at one of these new build housing yeah, projects. Exactly. He has to save up for a deposit. But, you know, he's been tethered by this, by this Benji character and hasn't yet left. The strength of the kitchen really lies in its environmental storytelling. As I said, I think like the way in which it does that twist of wealth disparity and overpopulation and the condensing of culture, I think is what is, is a really well developed world. You've got Ian Wright who plays this um, really? pirate radio Wait, DJ. Footballer. Yeah, yeah, oh, the footballer, right. that, that like match of the day competition. He, he plays this, this guy called the Kitchener who runs this pirate radio station and he blasts out the music of the people there. And he's sort of like this moral compass and he's this overseeing figure and he's really great in it. And it's, what I think it really captures well, this sense that culture and people are irreplaceable and they're sort of unreplicatable and that you can't just uplift and rebuild mm. culture. And I, I've lived in London my whole life and I think if you, if you know London, you'll see how much it's changed and how there's been, I think, a varying quality of urban redevelopment. Like some of these don't really work. Yeah. And you can see sort of cultures taken from, from certain areas. Um, and so that side of it is really cool. I really think that whole world is interesting. Mm. As a film and as a story, it just for me didn't get out of second gear. Mm. As as a, you know, talking about the dynamic between these two people, exploring the world, the some of the raids that happen, you know, the, the the drumming goes up and the tension happens, and I'm almost excited, but I can't help but say I was actually quite bored for a lot of the film, which is a real shame. But the strength of the world carries you through, so I'm interested in it and I'm waiting. But a lot of the delivery is very subdued, very mumbly. Mm. And it doesn't ever, and you know, some of the characters aren't necessarily, by design, they, they are characters that aren't necessarily very good at being overly emotional and describing their feelings, which is fine. But I would have loved some comedic foil for that or someone who is an antagonist to them, who offer, like an like a antagonist who offers that kind of dynamism yeah. in this film. So it's a shame because it lays a very solid foundation, but ultimately quite forgettable the credits rolled and i thought oh yeah we're done and i guess that's i guess that's it i almost wonder if it um usually a lot of the times with film reviews i'm saying i wish you tried to do less within your runtime mm. but i can't help but thinking i would have actually loved you see to try and explore more things within this mm. world maybe in my head they were holding things back to hope maybe they could get some sequels commissioned mm. but that's me being, being very cynical all in all a little bit meh cooks on a low heat the kitchen Definitely. Never gets past the sizzle. Mm. Have you seen The Kitchen? It's on Netflix. Let us know your thoughts to hello at popkitchenpodcast.com. As before, we'd love to hear them. You know, like something about the delivery and the way in which it engages with its world. I almost feel like it's a bit too cool for school. Mm. It's trying to not get too emotional because, you know, you don't want to be like, you don't want to lean into your, into your premise. Or I'm like, you've got a good premise. Go on, yeah. lean into it. Give me something more. Give me some more emotion. Because the ideas are great. Don't be shy. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. 
I've also noticed with the kitchen, I, I, it kind of made me think that these Netflix things, sometimes there's, there's like a little bit of anticipation about them and a kind of a build up. And yeah. then when it kind of gets to the crest of the wave, when you feel like this film's going to come out and have its mm. moment, and then just kind of, and then buckles and then kind of slips away again. Mm. And we talked about this. There was a, a special we put out just around Christmas time. Where we talked about what happens to these films, specific, specifically Netflix films, when they go Some on the carousel. Feeling like they get lost in the shuffle. Get, and, and I kind of felt that like, with the kitchen, with Chicken Run, um, even in a way we leave the world behind. Yeah, they kind of like they come out and they people talk about them for maybe two days, and, uh, and, and then they're our just cycle gone. of content is so fast. Whereas if something is yeah. happening in real places like a cinema, yeah. so it's like oh, and it's coming out in cinema. This is a we're still coming out of this hybrid. Thing. But also like we, we've had a lot of people message the show saying, "Have you seen Society of the Snow?" Yeah, which we were keen to watch, and hopefully we'll review it at some point in the future. But it's like. That film for me was like, oh, that's just now suddenly on Netflix. Yeah, which out is nowhere. But why? I almost wish that had been like, don't release it on Netflix yet. Push it to me in the cinema, and yeah. then I know when it comes on Netflix in a few months' time, I'll be like, oh, well, I, that was pushed to me. That's valuable. Anyway, and like in terms of marketing, like some of these films are getting limited theatrical releases. Is that because you think that one will be good? So if it's not getting a theatrical yeah. release, is you, you therefore telling me that like it's on? But don't worry if you don't. don't worry. It's also, just be there. It's worth saying, like, Killers of the Flower Moon has only just gone on Apple TV. Right? Right. It's been a three, four month window. And it's when been it, out for a and, long time. And when you went to see it, when it first came out in cinemas, you didn't know when it was going to be on Apple TV. No. And like, so we, we got a, 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 there was a notification this week that uh, Hitman, the Richard Linklater film that yeah. you loved last year, Brilliant. it's coming out in June, long time to wait, limited to its cinematic release, mm. and then on Netflix. And I'm like, why can't you just release it in cinemas Forget, forget the fact it's going to come on stream. Enjoy your Just run. Get people, make some money. Yeah, get a, get a run time yeah. out of it. You're right. Have a, get yeah. let people connect with it. Let it let it permeate the culture a little bit, and then three months later, it'll come on Netflix for the rest of time. Exactly. And people will go, yeah. oh, him, man. I saw that advertised. Yeah. And um, I I saw some people go to the cinema. Yeah, uh, that's worthy to me. Oh, it's uh, I've got to see it in cinema. Do I? Yeah. Oh, sense of urgency, limited time window. I'll it's go this funny week. That a few years ago knowing something was a Netflix film or any streaming platform, yeah. but really a Netflix film was like, oh, that's great. It's it's open, accessible. I, I, accessible. But now I actually see it being like, oh, it's now locked on the carousel with everything else. Yeah, lost. When well, you get distracted by something. It's yeah. like, imagine buying something new, like, in, like a new pair of jeans or something. Like, oh, these are great. Or like a new coat. And this is amazing. Yeah, and I'm going to put it in with every other single item of clothing. Every coat. New seven. coat. And not just your wardrobe. I mean, just yeah. like in the warehouse of your clutter. Yeah. Oh, okay. Where's the kind of special moment? Leave the coat by the door. Yeah, leave yeah, the coat by the yeah. door, man. We, we, we talked about, sorry, one other thing. This is actually going back to episode four of Pulp Kitchen, I believe. Whoa. Where you and I talked about the difference. Scorsese had written this thing about why cinemas matter and we agree with him entirely. And, yeah. I, and I said at the time, it's the difference between an art gallery and a warehouse. In an art gallery, you have purpose. Art gallery being a cinema in this instance. Yeah. And a warehouse being like Netflix, which is a, you know, uh, an art gallery has purpose made space for you to focus and hone in and, and celebrate individual mm. works of art. Whereas the kind of streaming model is a bit like a warehouse, which is like every, the Costco, it's the Costco thing. We've yeah. got everything at big size, come get it. But then it becomes, dev it actually devalues. Mm. You that. know why we're a little bit obsessed with this? Is because like obviously doing this show, we make decisions every day over what to cover on the show. Yes. Stuff that we're both interested in that we think has value for you guys. So I think sometimes because we're so plugged in and we get marketing emails yeah. and we're like actively trying to find things that are interesting to us. Sometimes I think we're a bit thrown by there's things we know we're going to like that get marketed marketed to us that get a shit hot trailer and they get a theatrical release and we know it's big. And there's other things that like, I think that's really interesting, but it's not really getting a theatrical release. Yes. I've got to, should I be covering this? Like, is this worth viewing? And yeah. sometimes you see something and it's okay, but no one else is seeing it. And I think it throws us a little yeah, bit. Yeah. And I, I, I think we want very clear f f guidelines to be like, this is this type of film. Yeah. And this is this type of film. This one's going to be very good. Yeah. This might be shit, <laughs> but you might like it. But if it's good, great, go yeah. recommend it. Um, Anyway, tangent yes, there about tangent. streaming, but uh, that was The Kitchen. If you've seen it, let us know your thoughts. George, should we go through some of the emails that we get sent into the show every single I'd week? You can write in your thoughts, your questions, your concerns, your reactions to our reviews to hello at popkitchenpodcast.com, just like Emily did. Emily, friend of the right, show. Friend of the show, Emily. Always just sort of DMing us some thoughts. 
Love it. Emily writes into the show and she said, just watch The Holdovers, guys. We reviewed The Holdovers last week. Please go and check that out yep. if you haven't already. Thought it was absolutely incredible. What I found the most interesting is was, was that the cinema was full, full caps. Mm. I've been to see all the big releases since Christmas. Ferrari, which I agree was crap. Poor Things, Priscilla, The Boys in the Boat, etc. And they've been basically empty except today, which was rammed. Large groups too. Just found it quite surprising. I put that down to two things. First of all, I think Paul Giamatti and Devine Joy Randolph were on Graham Norton. Oh, that will help. On the Friday night. Yeah. And this was, I think this would have been the Sunday after. Probably, yeah. Um, also, it's got a lot of love. Like I said, it's, mm. it's just a very popular film. Mm. It already has momentum behind it. This is like when we talked in our Oscars thing about it. I think it's doing I said well. this very briefly in our Oscars chat, but I said catching up with people this week, a lot of people have been coming to say how refreshing and new it feels. And I'm quite happy to recommend it because I think it's quite an easy watch. And a right. crowd pleaser. And I also said this in our Oscars channel. Yes. Well, you will have to get into it, but I said, that what I liked about the holdovers and I think what the appeal is, is that it's something that is both very familiar and new at the mm. same time. Yeah. Speaking of the holdovers, if you follow us on Instagram and TikTok, which many of you already do, you'll podcast. see that we got sent a lovely package by Universal with some nice- Oh, that was nice. Uh, nice gift hampers, which we've got some still left here. Yeah. First of all, the soundtrack on vinyl, which I love because it's in period. And I like the design of that. The, the design of that is very period, like 70s, almost vaguely horror horror inflected. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but what I like is that there's, uh, if there's lots of like deep cut, crate found um, Christmas songs in there, as well as just kind of like um, the Chamber Brothers and like the Allman Brothers, like really got like, period detail songs. It's like in there. they pulled it out of a high school time capsule. Yeah, from yeah. The, from the time. And if you if you'd held this up out. to me and we'd never heard of the holdovers and you were like, oh, the, and I'd be like, oh, this film did come out in the 70s. Yeah. It's coming out that vibe. Yeah. And also- We've got uh, a hip flask with the holdovers on it. A nice notepad. And also something that I have been wearing, which is very cozy. Oh, have you been whipping it out? Lovely. Like, Look um, at that. Little jersey. When I wear this, I feel like- Collegiate. Coach will let me play. Yeah. You know, I, I feel for <laughs> once, damn James, it, coach. that I actually have a shot at the athletics yeah. team. And yeah. maybe I'll dodge the draft, okay? <laughs> but um, <laughs> thanks again to Universal for sending us those. Uh, we feel very, very, very spoiled. I can't wait to drink out of my flask. Yes, we need to talk about your yeah. problem, James. <laughs> James. Help me. Um, but that was The Holdovers. Check out our review from last week. We both really liked it. And as we said, it's a very popular film, but on with other correspondents. Like an email from Honey, uh, who says, Hello, lads, my second ever email to you. Honey's become a bit of a friend of the show. Hi, Honey. I've noticed that uh, active on Instagram and email. I like that. Um, I've been re-listening really to a lot of your podcasts. And during episode 36... Long time ago. Yeah. You discuss cinema mishaps, wrong film playing, technical issues, yes. etc. Yeah. This reminded me of something that happened a few years ago. I was at the world premiere of Ben Wheatley's In the Earth in oh. 2021. This was a big deal as it was a time between lockdowns and the first time anyone had really been allowed to go to the cinema for a while. So it was a big deal. We all settled into our seats, the lights dimmed, and the screen blared br glared bright red and flickery with a strange rumbling sound, so loud that the cinema was shaking a little oh bit. Oh my God. Now, with a lot of us being familiar with Ben Wheatley's previous work, see um, Kill List, A Field yeah. in England, etc., cetera, yeah. uh, High Rise. High Rise, yeah. We assumed it was part of the film, as he often features weird psychedelic sequences in his films. Mm. I looked over and saw that the star of the film, Reese Shearsmith, I like Reese Shearsmith, good actor, was in front of me with his entire family, and Wheatley was sat not too far from me too. A lot of cast and crew were there. As this went on, the cast and crew all looked more anxious, oh agitated, God. and confused. People started to walk out, and it was so awkward. As this horrible red screen and rumbling sound continued for 20 minutes Whoa. before any, before someone came on stage to tell us it was a technical issue. 20 minutes? 20 minutes, I know. The film eventually stopped, and after an hour of waiting, we finally got to watch the film. I have never felt such an awkward and embarrassing atmosphere oh for a world God. premiere and for this to happen. Yikes. This brings me to my question. Has anything awkward or embarrassing ever happened to you in a cinema or at a film event? Or have you witnessed anything that has given you secondhand embarrassment that you will always associate with a film? Love you, honey. Thank you, honey. Nothing to that extent, but no. at the premiere with the cast and director. No. God, yeah. Some kid in the projection booth like stamped on a cable. Yeah, and like must have really badly damaged uh, really a, a projector. <laughs> I yeah, I can't think of anything sort of embarrassing or touch with that doesn't happen, mm. but or, or secondhand embarrassing. But the thing about Ben Wheatley, I would just say is that Ben Wheatley, like, like ten years ago, was like the the golden boy of um, yeah. 
indie British film. People like Empire like loved him because he was he made Sightseers, Kill List, High Rise, Remember Killed High in Rise. England. I didn't get on with it. No, I didn't really like filming. But Kill List is, is pretty cool. But he was like, oh, oh Free Fire as well. And he was like this interesting yeah, auto director. Indie. Last year he directed The Meg Two. <laughs> No, yeah, that was. And I'm like, you know, <laughs> what? a boy's got to eat. Yeah, don't take, don't, get don't, back. don't yeah, let yeah. me judge you for <laughs> yeah. whatever you want. I was just suddenly like, that's a that's a handbrake turn. That, that happened, yeah. It's the Megalodon. The, the Meg 2. Yeah. Interesting. Maybe he's got something up his sleeve. Anyway, I, thank uh, you, honey, for that email. I saw the trailer for The Beekeeper with Jason Statham. I'm a bloody beekeeper. No, oh, no, he's, he's, not. he's doing an American accent, I'm which I just beekeeper. think you hire Jason Statham to do, J- sorry, sorry, to do Jason Statham. You don't get him to do an American accent. No. I, I've seen from the trailer, it's not good. Oh and it's like, I'm a bee. He's a beekeeper who's also part of like a you secret ring of assassins. I know. I, I can't do an American. Feel my sting. Yeah. And it's like, if you disrupt the hive, you're going to, the bees will come after you. And like Jeremy Irons is in it. I saw that and I was like, that is such a January release. Yeah. That is such a, only in January would you get a Jason Statham movie called The Beekeeper. But J- Jason Statham has transcended needing to be anything else. Well, well done, Jason Statham. I've no, yeah. I've no qualms about that. Mm. And I know if I see you, I'll want a Jason Statham film. But why lie? Why, li- why get him to do anything other than, he's doing action. He's not doing a rom-com. He's doing Jason yeah. Statham thing. But why just, oh, you know all that takes is one line to be like, yeah, when I moved here from England. That's all yeah. you need. And it's, yeah. sort, it's sorted. I used to be in the SAS. I used, yeah. But back in London, where I'm from. Done. Solved. I, I don't need that much more convincing. Yeah. Anyway, this next one's from Olivia, who writes into the show and says, Night Swim and ISS. Hi, guys. I hope all is well. I just listened to your review about Night Swim. You can check that out on our feed. And I wanted to share my thoughts. I totally agree with you that the film is basically garbage, but is still fun <laughs> and worth the watch. I went to a theater with a guy I've been seeing, had a few drinks, and had a blast despite its silliness. Yeah. That's exactly what I said. Great. Yeah. Fun, funny date. You can make fun of it on your date. That's what I think. Uh, One thing I wanted to point out was again about trailers. The film's trailer showed the only two or three scary scenes almost in their entirety in the trailer. This is true. Uh, I really wish the industry would get behind giving more while showing less. This made those scenes flat as I'd seen them before. Comments on if the industry will start changing trailers. Lastly, I saw ISS and I would argue no one should really waste their time on it. I don't think the runtime was more than 90 minutes, but it felt like an eternity to get through. Thanks for everything, guys. Olivia in New Hampshire. Just on your comment about Night Swim, those two scenes that uh, you mentioned that were scary are the only good bits of the film. Yeah. So the film would not be able to sell you or if it showed you anything else because you'd yeah. probably be laughing. But I agree that those scenes are great and they were spoiled in the trailer. I had not heard of ISS, which is a new film with Ariana DeBose in it. Um, yeah. But it has a very, very mixed reaction online. But thanks. Sir. This is what I do like. Like We, we, we are up in the crow's nest and we try and keep a... a, a a periphery, yeah. you know, a view on everything that's coming out, like coming away. But, but, but sometimes things, things do things get past us, and so we appreciate that you guys are in the front lines, seeing stuff and letting us know. What also, they are. like a lot of horror films, that that was adapted from a short called Night Swim, which is one of those horror. I think it's the Marco Polo one. So th- these horror concepts are made with like a six minute <laughs> runtime in mind, which lends itself to a trailer, yeah. and these often don't sort of. Uh, work as a 90 minute film this next email is from Robbie who says hi guys new listener from sunny Swansea I came across you on Instagram actually but I now follow you on the other one too I've been catching up on your pod on Spotify from the very beginning and I've just completed 2022 I like that you've completed a year yes Loving the pod. The enthusiasm you both have for films and TV is great, and the joy you show is infectious. Oh, thank thank you. you. I've recently w- watched The Northman, Banshees of Inisherin, and The Last Ju- Jewel based on your recommendations. Nice. Very good. Great thank films. Thank you. Um, we talk about The Last Jewel and some of Ridley Scott's films with James from Raids of the yeah. Lost podcast in that bonus episode this week. Long story short, go see it. Yes. Um, however, I'm emailing about TV shows. I enjoyed your review of the best shows of the last decade and delving into the current shows, House of the Dragon, uh, Rings of Power, etc. Mm-hmm. However, I think there are a couple of mi- omissions from your discussion. Okay. Fargo. Based on the film, lo- loosely based on the film, it is brilliant. Martin Freeman and Billy Bob Thornton were phenomenal in the first season and it's continued with quality into its fifth season. Now, yes, I've seen the first two seasons. I've only heard of excellent things. Yeah, great too. Um, second one was a little bit slow, but very good. And then I never caught up and I'm he- hearing good things about the fifth one now, but mm. they're kind of standalone. They're in an anthology series, Fine. so you can really enjoy it that way. Um, Peaky Blinders is a top quality UK yeah. show of the last second. Never seen it, James. Uh, I've watched a bit of the first season and I really liked it, but it came to me at the wrong time and mm. I would love to uh, I'd love to get to it at some point. Some people really yeah. swear by it, don't they? A lot of guys 
when it first got big, our age got very much inspired by the haircuts and the suits. There's something I find a little icky about people who love, love Peaky, Peaky Blinders. Blinders and they stand around in, in three-piece tweed suits <laughs> think, with like high fades. And, and I'm the, like, yeah. really? You think you're, okay. I've also seen sort of men, middle-aged men in sort of uh, T-shirts <laughs> stretched over beer bellies that say, by order of the Peaky Blinders. Oh, and I'm a bit like, Meh. Such an ick. I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> no disrespect to the show, of course. And more recently, The Boys on mm. Prime, a new refreshing yet much darker take on superheroes, uh, which has quickly become one of my favorite shows ever. My, I watched the first episode, didn't get any further than my that. My friend, friend of the show, Ryan, always goes on about The Boys to me. He's mm. always like saying, oh, you should watch it. It's great, great. But I just, I never do. But yeah, I same. believe him. I do oh, yeah, yeah, him. I've heard yeah, good things. Uh, we'd love to hear your thoughts on these shows, but we just gave them to you. Mm -hmm. Hoping you also rate them highly. Looking forward to hearing your views when I catch up uh, to date, in a week or two. Keep up the good work. Steaming through, Robbie. Robbie. Thank you, Robbie. Steaming through. This next one is from Ricard. He says, hi, my name is Richard and I'm a Swede, but his... Uh, okay, so he says Richard, but in his email thing, it says R-I-K-A-R-I-D. Rickard. Yeah, Rickard. R-I-K-A-R-I-D, yeah. yeah. Uh, my name is Richard and I'm a Swede living and working in Tajikistan. Wow. Last auto... I'll be honest. Okay. I've not heard of Tajikistan. <laughs> You have, you've heard I've heard it, but I don't like... It's one of the stands. It's one of the stands, you yeah. Tajikistan. Afghanistan. Uzbekistan. Uzbekistan. Well, Afghanistan, Afghanistan is a stand, but it's not one of the former Soviet stands. I so, I mean... Uh, <laughs> You're the worst. I am the You're worst. You're the worst. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm just trying to be accurate. <laughs> yeah, we're just saying stands. It wasn't a... Pakistan. Pakistan. Yeah, be, not yeah. technically a Soviet stand, but yeah. still... Um, you can slap me in a minute. It's fine. It just, I just want everyone to observe that. Last time, <laughs> so I, I just... I, 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 someone on Instagram was like, it, George is surely absolutely gaslighting everyone when he says that he never corrects yeah, James. Yeah, I know. It's like more people come in and just correct that. I'm Thank just you. trying to uphold standards for you guys. It's abuse. Okay. Last autumn, I discovered your podcast via Instagram Reels, and I now exclusively watch you on YouTube. Richard. Thank you. Uh, starting to go through your back catalogue, I felt a few things needed to be mentioned. Okay, now you've complimented us for quite a few things. You said very nice things about our production value, which Thank is you. very much appreciated. We do try our best. Uh, two hours of making a whole. Oh, you do say your individual reviews are good, but they are so much better when both of you have seen it. So please keep up your tradition of adding to your original review when the other half have seen yeah. it later on. We, we try. will try. It's often hard we'll for us try. to, within the week that something's out, for both of us to have seen it. But what I have been enjoying is catching up when the other one has seen it in a bonus. So we sort of get to back and exactly. forth. So check out the bonuses if you haven't. Number three, Nope. In your review of Nope, it seems both of you missed something very central to the story being told. The story of the boy and the chimpanzee is an analogy for what is happening in the film. Thinking you can control and manipulate a wild animal, animal they boy, now a man, learned nothing from his traumatic experience as a child. The film has many themes in layers, but this particular one is about the hubris of man and how history repeats itself. Another is that the director, Holst, played by Michael Wincott, is Ahab and he is chasing his Moby Dick. Um... I would say I got that. Even though we didn't mention Partly. it, I would, say, I would say I kind of got that. I thought it was also, I'd go further. I think actually, sorry, we're talking about Nope. Which nope, that was like eight your months mind ago. Back, yeah. But like Stephen Yun's character, if anything, is that that very traumatic thing happens with the chimpanzee, but he almost has a special connection because for some reason the chimpanzee doesn't attack him. Yeah. And he almost has a special connection. And it's like with what's happening in the cloud, he's like trying to recapture that kind of divine connection to a to a much higher predator. His his character felt again not seen it so long a bit underexplored from my first viewing, and I did it. I yeah. wasn't there for it, unfortunately. I also just think the chimpanzee stuff is so interesting that oh, should just brilliant. be the main story of the yeah, film. Like, that that's was really great. really cool. That was really good. Anyway, uh, number three, Dirty Dancing. I enjoyed your review of Dirty Dancing, and you mentioning the weird comment at the end of the film. Yes. If you know the uh, when we did our sort of films we caught up on over the over the Christmas break, I saw Dirty Dancing for the first time. Yeah, if you know the history of the cat skills, what the owner says actually makes sense. Met, uh, George, the comment was... So I, I made a, it was just a flippant, jokey comment about the fact that at the end of Dirty, at the end of Dirty Dancing, uh, Kellerman, who runs the Kellerman camp, he says, oh, it's all changing now. Kids don't want to go away with their parents to Europe anymore. I'm mm. oh, sorry. Kids don't want to go away with their parents anymore. They want to go to Europe, 22 countries yeah. in three days. And we were like, 22 countries in three days. That's ridiculous. But obviously he just means like, kids just want to go far away. Yeah. Um, many of the Catskill Hotel resorts were a sanctuary from the early 1900s onward for New York Jews where they could go on vacation without being harassed and discriminated. It wasn't until the end of World War II that the climate for Jews in America so slowly started to change and when the movie takes place in the early 60s, that's when this era came to an end. This part of the Catskills was also called the Borscht Belt. Yeah, so I, it's I've, our end. yeah, I've heard of the Borscht Belt and I think that's actually quite an interesting observation that in the 60s, not only would you have, as you say, uh, things, the climate changing in the in the US, but also the climate maybe 
changing in Europe, but also you have children of um, uh, Jewish emigres who are, co- yeah. who, have co- who are second generation, coming, coming of age, and, 20s. and want to go to explore. Where people might have, who, if they'd emigrated from Europe yeah. in the early first, in the first half of the 20th century, very traumatic period. Financially, also like pros- prosperous people being yeah. able to afford holidays and homes. Yeah, Does that's quite an nice? interesting observation, Richard. Uh, number four, review requests. I would love to hear your thoughts on the films The Empty Man and The Artifice Girl, two films that are highly underrated and both get overlooked. I will end this info dumping with a question. Uh, George, do you want to comment on either of those? Well, I've never heard I've of The Artifice Girl. Yeah. The Empty Man, is that a horror film? I, I've not heard of either of them, but maybe we should look the into Empty them. The Empty Man, yeah, I have heard of that. No, no, look, point being, we've not, we've not seen either. I will end this info dumping with a question. Can you name a film or a film event that radically shaped the way you view film or perhaps even life? Wow. For me, it was the year 1991 when I was 12 going on 13 and watched The Silence of the Lambs, which George talked about uh, recently yeah. in that same episode. Terminator 2, Point Break, Cape Fear and JFK on the big screen. Wow. And it shaped what I still prefer to watch and read and later influenced what I studied at uni and even choice of career. Thanks to the Quality po- po- Podcast. Sincerely, Richard. I mean, you kind of talking like, has there been a kind of uh, divine mm, moment where you go and see... Outside of obvious ones, which I, I would have covered. Here I go, I'm going to correct you again. Not a divine intervention, more of a, a divine, divine conversion. conversion. Yes, thank conversion. you. Not, it wouldn't be an intervention, yeah. I'm insufferable um, today. Yeah, Please yeah it's getting me. worse. <laughs> 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 um, I feel like we've covered the sort of seminal cinema experiences that are why we're here today in really early episodes. Yeah. I can't think of one moment where I've gone, oh my God, it feels yeah. like me. No, yeah, neither. It's like things I watched a lot as a kid. But um, Richard, thank you so much for your email. And this last email is from Ryan who says, hey guys, I'm a new listener and I've really been enjoying your stuff. Welcome. Keep up the good work. Thank you, Ryan. Yes, welcome to the show. Just listen to you talk about One Life. One Life, which I reviewed yes. last week, new Anthony Hopkins movie. As someone who, ha- who wasn't overly familiar with the story, I thought it was amazing. It was so heartwarming, yet so sad. And the main scene toward the end brought a tear to my eye. And like everyone, I love Anthony Hopkins. I also just saw Poor Things, which James finally caught up with last week, yes, reviewed in the bonus. Yep. I reviewed before Christmas. I felt like this this was as if Tarantino made Barbie. It was completely mm. insane and bizarre, but I loved every minute of it. It was also like looking into a painting for two and a half hours. I thought it was such a beautiful movie. I agree with that. That's I wanted awesome. to give a shout out to my favorite movie of all time, one that I find most people haven't even ever seen. It's called Remember the Titans, starring Dan- Denzel Washington. It's pretty much the story of, a, of the first one of the first mixed race high schools and their football team. I think it's brilliant, super cheesy, but the, but the definition of heartwarming and some amazing 70s music throughout. Immaculate vibe. Wondering if you guys have seen it. Ryan from Canty Luth in Ireland. Remember the, the, the Titans. Remember the Titans sounds very familiar. I think Ryan Gosling's in that. Yeah, he is. I've never seen it. 2000. Uh, it's got Denzel Washington and Ryan Gosling. Nice. And yeah, I've, I've not... I, I, oh, I know that dvd cover yes <laughs> of his face yes also looks like the cover of prometheus if denzel washington was like that stone head oh be very good yeah. doesn't it yeah. yeah or the mummy with stephen summers and if he was the, the sphinx yeah the yeah. sphinx face yeah yeah very good very good guys thank you so much for sending in your emails we do have more to read out but we are just trying to be conscious of the length of the show we are now going to hand over to james and george from a few days ago with James from Raiders of the Lost Post podcast. Enjoy the games. He was really good fun. Yeah. And don't forget to tune in to his bonus episode that's coming out Friday. And if you haven't already, check out, which will hopefully be out by this time, our reacting to the 2024 Oscar nominations. James, do you forgive me for correcting you a little bit? I, I've just completely come to peace with it. I, I, if, if, I, if, it if it was a problem, it, I'd know about it. Would work. Yeah. The thing is, James, I, I take he- a lot of my stride. I, I hear it. And I, and I want to do better. I want to do better. <laughs> I should correct myself. That's what it is. We're all trying to walk a better path. In George, life. never change. Stay, stay exactly as you are. Uh, I'll tell you when you're out of order. Thank you. Uh, guys, thank you so much for listening to this episode of Pop Kitchen. Don't forget, we post new episodes of the show every single Wednesday. As mentioned, lots of stuff to look at. It's actually, we've got a lot of exciting things planned, oh, yeah. not just for bonus content, but also for the socials as well. So Follow keep, the socials. Keep following us on TikTok and Instagram. Like, share, engage, comment. Tell your friends and also continue to rate and leave comments on Apple TV, Apple Podcasts, Spotify. Give us the little rating. It really makes a big difference. Without revealing what we want to do, I just want to say that what's great about the social, our social media feed is that it 
it's amazing for discovery and inviting people into Pulp Kitchen and letting us know about the show. But I think if we're to be overly critical, people who already follow us are seeing clips from podcasts they've already listened to. Yes. So what our main focus is, is to make content that you don't get on the show. Yeah. There will be fun film content with great creators you just stick around to see it that you cannot get from watching to the show. So it's worth, if you do follow us, to stay tuned and follow it and provide some value to you guys. 2024, there. baby. Thank you. Here we go. Guys, thank you so much for joining us. As we all know, Pop Kitchen ends with a game. With a game. But today we have special guest is James from Raiders of the Lost podcast. James, thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me all the way out here in London, mate. <laughs> right, James, we... We take our games seriously. Yeah. We are big on trivia, big on, big on film quizzes, as you've seen us on social media. We mm -hmm. do like to throw out some trivia out there. How are you feeling in your first Pop Kitchen Games section? I'm excited. We do trivia on our show too. We do an intermission every episode. Yeah. We do our fun uh, little trivia games, but you guys think take it a little more seriously than <laughs> us. But I'm I'm ecstatic because I love the clips of you guys doing trivia and I love listening to it. So I'm 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 jo I'm stoked. Let's do this. Amazing. So my first game for you is a Pop Kitchen classic. It's called Cast List Countdown. I'm going to read you the members of a cast, and you have to tell me what film it is before I get to the end of the cast list. Okay. okay? okay. I'm going to start with the supporting actors, and I will lead eventually to the star. Okay. Are you, are you good on the rules? I'm ready. And you can shout out the film at any time. So okay. technically, the sooner you get it, the better. But if you don't get it, I'm also rubbish. So it's all fine. <laughs> okay. Here we James, go. are you ready? I'm ready. You have to guess the film from its cast. Ready? Ready. Carl Chandler. Jamie Bell. Thomas Creshman, Colin Hanks, Adrian Brody, Andy Serkis, oh. Jack Black, last one, Naomi Watts. That is a crazy cast. What movie is that? <laughs> Jamie Bell? Okay, clue. From 2005, big movie, not critically loved. Big director. Big, Big director. director. 2005. Tom Hanks, Andy Serkis in a movie together? Colin Hanks. Col I'm Colin, Colin, oh, Colin, Colin Hanks. Hanks. Yeah, Colin Hanks. All right, Andy Serkis. Col I'm trying to think of Andy Serkis' filmography besides Lord of the Rings. A quite young Jamie Bell. Quite young Jamie Bell. A dashing Adrian Brody. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> the Jack Black is throwing me way Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's a very long jump, that role. Okay, I'm going to tell you. The answer is Peter Jackson's King Kong. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Which is actually... You that's that a, that's a good cost. question. Yeah. And it's a quite, for the scale of that film, quite forgotten. Yeah. Yes, absolutely forgotten. It's actually really good. I have quite a, a soft spot yeah. For, yeah. for King Kong, but I don't think it made the impact that, oh, I saw for that amount of money, it, it needed to have. Yeah. It was the first time I saw Carl Chandler, and I remember thinking, he's so period. In yeah. That. He oh absolutely God. suits a 30s really movie style. Well. He's very yeah. funny. Yeah. And, I, and every time, I, he's also, Carl Chandler has a face that fits kind of any period from in the 20th century. Yes. Yeah. Um, he's great in Wolf of Wall Street as well. Yeah. Jack Black is the guy who is running the whole thing, right? That's he's like right. in charge of the whole yeah. He's the film, he's like the desperate filmmaker. Yeah, just yeah. whatever happens, just get the shot. Oh my God. Get the shot run. What a I good think, question. I it's a good one, isn't it? I don't think the CG of that film will hold up very well. No. I think it was that period where the technology got better, so therefore they used CG a lot more than they probably should have. Yes. It's in that sort of noughties period. But yeah. that was your first one. I've also, got one more for you. that was oh, when Kong was like how the size he was meant to be. And then yeah, when, yeah. When, when they were like for, now. For, to fight Godzilla, right? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. I will give a shout out to when King Kong fights two or three T-Rexes. That is a great action scene. <laughs> oh, yeah, channel your jaw. inner nine-year-old yeah. and go watch that scene. It's genuinely really good. A, a shout out to the PlayStation game again of that, which <laughs> by all standards today is terrible. I don't but, think it's a good game But, but, but I, I played a lot of hours on that game, yeah. okay? There's a difference between a good game and a game you played. That's it, yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. it. Okay, I've got one more cast as countdown ready. for you. Are I'm you ready. ready? I think you'll get this, Hopefully. based on our conversations. Ready? You have to guess the film from its cast in three, two, one. Benedict Wong, Nick Muhammad, Jeff Daniels, Sebastian Stan, Michael Pena, Ant Man, no, Mackenzie Davis, Kristen Wiig, Sean Bean, three more, Kate Mara. Jessica Chastain. What movie is this? And last one, Matt Damon. 
Oh, the Martians. Yeah. The <laughs> <laughs> you number know, of times you kept saying the Martians there, and I was like, shit, he's going to get this shit away. <laughs> That's so tough when you Did you, you put Donald like Glover in there as well? No, I, I had to cut some. There's actually yeah. loads yeah. more in this cast. There's loads. And then but... I'm thinking Sean Bean, like, does he, what yeah. movie does Sean Bean die in? That, that yeah, 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 yeah. It's one of the films where he's like, we played a game the other, like, a few no months ago. No one dies in the Martian. That's what we yeah, said. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, like, name, name films where Sean Bean survives, and it's surprisingly hard to yeah. name the films Yeah, and Kristen Wiig works at NASA. That's right. That's a good game. Big, 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 uh, and, um, squad. Mrs. Like uh, Mrs. Maisel, Rachel Brosnahan is in Brosnahan. that as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Brosnahan? Brosnahan. 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 Yeah. Brosnahan. Brosnahan. Jeff Daniels is the head of NASA in that movie, I think. That's, that's what, like, Jeff Daniels threw me off. I'm like, Benedict Wong and Jeff Daniels wait, in that movie? Yeah. Isn't Chibita Lucia in that as well? Yeah, he yeah. is. No, he yeah. Is. We could have been here all day. The cast is amazing in that cost. movie. Yeah, great yeah. ensemble. Oh, Man, that is so tough when you do it now. That's a great idea for questions. Uh, it's hard because you get distracted by every single one that comes on. Yeah. Um, so that's all the cast is. I have one more round of a game for okay. you. Let's it's quite it. intense. Are you, are you good for this? I'm ready. Yeah. Let's do it. Do, so I, this, do I have to time this? I don't have to time this one. Uh, no, I can kind of. It's basically. It. So this, we used to play a game which was name seven in 30 seconds. That's okay. why I'd be like name seven Marvel movies in 30 seconds. Yes, do it in 30 seconds. Then we sort of condensed it and made it harder. So you've got to name three things in six seconds. Okay. <laughs> But these are easier. There's only four questions within this game, but you basically have to answer them really quickly within six seconds. Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. James, you have to tell me the answer to these questions within six seconds. Ready? Name three Damien Chazelle films. Whiplash, La La Land, and uh, First Man. Yes. Name three characters in an Indiana Jones film that aren't Indiana Jones. Um, oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Raiders of the Lost Boy. Well, I forget everything. <laughs> uh, senior. <laughs> I love it. That's one. Name three non Scorsese Leonardo DiCaprio films. Um, the Revenant. Yes. Wolf. Oh, man. Uh, the Revenant. Crap. What am I doing right now? This is so hard. <laughs> <laughs> the Revenant. Basketball thinking... Diaries. And I can't think right now. Almost. Right. Almost. Last one. Name three James Corden films. Cats, <laughs> yes. the musical, um, Into the Woods, yes, and I don't know. Oh, what's the other one? Ocean's Eight, I think. Ocean's Eight, one. yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's right. And there the, you go. The Holy crap, well. yeah. that's hard. Isn't that's it? hard <laughs> for Leo. Titanic. I know, like yeah. Leo is like one of my favorites. Revolutionary too. Road. Yeah. It's about not the aviator. But what's eating Gilbert Grape? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Inception. Django. Inception. Yeah. Django. Holy crap! It's and then hard. characters. I thought I'm, I'm disappointed in you for the Indiana Jones one. I know, me too. <laughs> I just went like blank, dude. You and got like it's... short round, Willie, uh, Fleabag, Fleabag. <laughs> <laughs> Helen, Helena, oh Helen, Helen. Yeah, yeah. Helena. Uh, it's hard. Who's Shia LaBeouf? What's his name? Ju Mutt. Junior. No, Junior. No, he's, no. They call him Mutt. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Mutt. yeah. Oh, oh um, hang on. What's the, the uh, Gimli? Sulla. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah, it's hard. It's tough. I was seeing all the faces, but I was just like, <laughs> yeah. when you're in the moment, that is a difficult game. <laughs> yeah. I the watched classic. the clip, I'm like, oh, this is easy. It's classic, like, don't think of an elephant. And all you're thinking of is elephants, elephants, elephants. Inception elephants. quote. Oh, ah, yeah. very good. <laughs> yeah. Now I have some games for you. All right. I've got good. two for you. Okay. <laughs> so we are going to play a name seven in 30. Okay. I'm going to play two rounds. James, would you do me the honors yes, of, of timing me 30 seconds? Okay. So. First round is this. Just waiting for James to get his Sorry. timer up. My keyboard's being weird. James is, op James is opening every single app <laughs> on his phone except <laughs> the timing app. Right, we're okay. ready to go. So, Raiders of the Lost podcast is a show co-hosted by you and your identical twin brother. So, James, in 30 seconds, name for me seven movies that feature twins, identical or non-identical. Can I have a question? Can I? Yes. Can it be doppelgangers too? Or no, it twins. It has to be twins? Twins. Go. Twins. Yep. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> um, meet the no. Uh, Parent trap. Yep. Um, you are a twin. <laughs> I have a twin. Uh, what's it called? Oh my god, this is tough. Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. Harry Potter and Sorcerer's Stone. Uh, Harry yeah, Potter. Right. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. <laughs> One franchise. Of <laughs> all right, all right. Let's go. Cool. Uh, Star Wars. Yes. Um. And time. Oh, okay. when I get five. You know so what you could have got? Matrix Two with Ma the ghost twins. Yes. <laughs> so basically, when I thought of that question, I was like, I don't, I can't think of seven myself. But yeah. I, I don't even know if there are seven. But I thought I'd put it to you anyway. Yeah. yeah the, the Star Wars one, they are technically twins. Mary Kate and Ashley Olsen yeah. is a good shout to go. Yeah. yeah. So New York Minute, your favorite New York film. Minute, yes, of course. Um, you said Parent Trap, of course. Yeah, Harry Potter. Are there any others been missing? Obvious ones. <sighs> What's that? That college movie that Jonah Hill's in, where he plays. 
They're, it's 21 like 21 Jump Street. No, it's the other one where it's uh, he's, he's it's younger in his career. Super bad? No, not super bad. Uh, I can't remember. But there's twins in that movie. Oh, okay, right, yeah. Oh, Austin Powers in Goldmember, the um, fuck me and fuck you. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. It's a very dated joke, but yeah. just, just remember that. Anyway, twins, that was a twins uh, twins question. Good question. Yeah. You guys are good at this. Are like you ready it. for your last question? Let's do it. Of today. You're okay. James, in 30 seconds, can you name... Mm-hmm. James, in 30 <laughs> seconds, can you name for me the last seven best picture winners at the Oscars? That's 2017 to 2023. Go. Everything, everywhere, all at once. Um, 12 Years a Slave. Is that too early? Yeah, too, early. too early. Uh, oh, my God. Parasite. Yeah. We have Argo. I too early. before. <laughs> It's hard. <laughs> I'm trying to think of what's come out recently. Weird COVID ones. Weird COVID ones. No um, one saw. Oh, <laughs> uh, Zoe Chow's movie. Um, yeah. What's it called? Uh, oh. Time. Okay. <laughs> this is tough. This is tough. Chloe Zhao's movie is Nomadland. Nomadland. So I'll, I'll work backwards. So yeah. last year, Everything Everywhere All at Once. Yeah. Year before that, Coda. 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 No, yeah, that was my favorite movie at Sundance too. We never saw it. it. Uh, year before that, Nomadland. Uh, 2020 was Parasite. 2019 was Green Book. Green Book. <laughs> I know. I, I know. <laughs> like, so not best picture, but I know. Uh, 2018 was The Shape of Water. God, 2017 yeah. is Moonlight. Oh, Moonlight, of yeah. course. Yeah. I, my brain Famous still thinks it's not La La, La, La Land. Land. Yeah. yeah, but it's yeah. not. It's Moonlight, of course. Man. It's tricky. Yeah. It's, it's hard. For me, when I tried to do it on myself, it was those COVID era ones that really, yeah. even though I love Nomad Coda. Land, like, yeah. it really kind of caught me out. Yeah. Like, seven movies came out that year. That's why. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What do you think? If just talking about the Oscars, then you you think we asked you outside, didn't we? Oppenheimer is your. It, it, yeah. It's not only is it your choice, but do you think it's also the favorite to win? I think it's a shoe in. If Oppenheimer mm, doesn't win be Best well. Picture, I'll, I'd be so shocked. And also, Christopher Nolan deserves an Oscar. Finally, the guy's never won an Oscar. We should set a a challenge that if Oppenheimer doesn't win Best Picture, you have to like eat something on your show <laughs> <laughs> because we're going to set it down. You okay? You have to eat an entire apple pie on your podcast. I'm going to make it nice for you, but you have to eat the whole thing. <laughs> the whole thing. Or you can, if you can find it, eat an, a, an English pie. So it's a savory meat pie. You know, like, I've, I've been getting meat pies. I had okay. one last night. Yeah. You have to eat an entire, a big one, family size one, like uh, like a chicken pot pie or a steak and, steak and kidney pie on your show. If Oppenheimer doesn't win, and if it does win, you have to, eat have to an eat entire time. apple pie. He loves oh, that. He loves yeah, that. Mm, oh, but shame. this, I'm happy. I'm, I'm happy if Oppenheimer wins. It's not a bad thing. Yeah. I think you know, um, it's yes. done well. It seems to be clearing up a lot of I, awards. And I yeah. do agree with you. I think it's like this does seem to be Nolan's year, and I think it's perfectly fair. It is a really great movie. Um, yeah. I watched. I rewatched it recently with subtitles on and I, I think I got 30% more out of that movie, <laughs> honestly I liked yeah. it the first time but I, but I was a couple of things I was uncertain about it really kind of exhausted me but yeah because it's you know it's a, it's a long intense film but I really was able to it actually flipped some things that I thought were flaws previously into things that I think were strengths my my issue when we first watched it was that I felt that he was just cramming so much information into every single second of real estate of that film and then when I saw the you know the dialogue literally written in front of me I was like oh that's so clever and I actually think even though I've always thought Nolan's a better director than a writer, <coughs> I actually thought some of this is there's some really great sections of dialogue in Oppenheimer that I love. Like second, the last, sorry, the last hour of it is uh, from a writing perspective, I think is truly yeah. Impressive. I love the there's the scene on the train quite early on between David Cromholtz and uh, and and Oppenheimer where they're talking about like anti-Semitism and being a being a um, you know physics. Uh, Person, what's the word I'm looking at? Physics, Expert. scientist, no, not physician. Physician. No. <laughs> scientist, physicist, <laughs> physicist. <laughs> physics person. We're going, uh, yeah. Yeah. It's been a long day, um, <laughs> and I think that's actually really clever. So I, I agree. If I think he'll win best director, I think he'll win best picture, best actor, best supporting actor. He could win best screenplay. And the thing with Nolan, he's still a great writer, and he says his best script is a Howard Hughes script that he never got to make a movie of. Oh, he wanted really? he wanted Jim Carrey to play Howard Hughes in a wow. movie, but Scorsese wow. made The Aviator. Back in like 2004, oh, yeah, 2005. That's, true, that's yeah. when he wanted to do it, so he couldn't do it. But he said it's the best thing he's ever written. Oh my God, I would love to have yeah, seen that. For real. Jim yeah. Carrey in a Christopher Nolan film. <laughs> that's that is insane. insane. Yeah, it would have been great, I wow. bet. But I think Oppenheimer's an incredible script. But I mean, he's such a high concept guy. And the thing with him is he never got an Oscar nomination, I don't think, for Best mm. Director until Dunkirk. 
mm-hmm. which yeah. is so far into his career. It's, I mean, Scorsese, at least he had Oscar nominations. He didn't win until The Departed, which took 40 years for yeah. him in his career. Yeah. But for Nolan, I think he he deserves an Oscar for what he's meant to cinema. Culturally as well, exactly. within the last 15 years, I feel like he's such a center point for the blockbuster and the cinema experience. It almost mm. feels like he should be sort of jotted down part of history. And what mm. is it he, Robert Downey Jr. said at the Golden Globes, like, Christopher Nolan makes a uh, half black and white three hour long movie about uh, a physicist um, about a moral dilemma and it grosses yeah. over a billion dollars. Like, yeah. that's fantastic. Only, mm. only Christopher Nolan could do that. Exactly. Yeah. You know what I mean? exactly. Well, James, thank you so much for joining us. Don't forget, we have done a bonus episode with James all about his picks for some of the questions that you'll see on our social media. It was a really fun episode. Yeah. But James, just one more time, where can everyone find you and your podcast? Thanks for having me. Raiders of the Lost podcast is available everywhere. We're so easy to find. Instagram, Twitter, Spotify, Apple, wherever you listen to podcasts you can find us just search us anywhere google youtube whatever we're so if you can't find us then i'd be shocked but <laughs> it's a lot of fun i host it with my brother we've been doing it since 2020 we love cinema we love movies and we talk about new old movies our favorite movies of all time all the time we do four episodes a week we're pretty busy but it's been a blast in a life-changing uh, adventure. I really like your social clips as well. There's loads yeah. of like just little nuggets of film, things about things I didn't know about some of my favorite films. Definitely go and go and check it out. Thanks so much, guys. You're welcome, James. It's been a pleasure having you. And guys, just remember check out the a bonus episode with James on Friday this week, and continue to follow us on social media because we are putting out lots of interesting stuff. You'll see our clip with James that we're going to po- post out. And so, like, subscribe, follow. You know the drill. And otherwise, see, see you next week. week. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.